here's a segment from a recent Gun Talk Radio episode. You can listen to all the Gun Talk Radio podcasts however you tune in, or check out guntalk.com for more. Now, you know I've talked a lot about the culture wars and the use of language and how the gun ban lobby came up with terms like Saturday Night Special and assault weapon and a lot of different ones, and they use it to frighten people. And frightened people are easy to manipulate. Of course, the latest one is ghost gun, because, of course, ghosts are scary. <laughs> yeah, and, and they're, what we're talking about is home-built guns, homemade guns, all right? And a couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, the United States Senate Judiciary Committee held a hearing. They, they call their hearing Stop Gun Violence Ghost Guns. And they had people coming up there and testifying, and they had a a scholar, a firearms historian showed up there. I don't think they got what they thought they were going to get. That scholar is Ashley Lebensky, has been here many times before, former curator of the Cody Firearms Museum, Buffalo Bill Museum in Cody, Wyoming. She joins us right now. Hey, Ashley, how are you? Hey, I'm doing good. How are you? I am good. So, I mean, you're doing, you're, of course, the former curator. Now you're the curator emerita and senior firearms scholar as well as you got your own consulting group, the Gun Code. So you get called up to go to Washington, D.C. to testify before the Senate on so-called ghost guns. You yes. won't even give them the term. You cut them off right when you started talking. What was that about? Well, you know, it, the terminology that we use with firearms is something that we talk about a lot uh, when we were rebuilding the museum. And as I said in my oral testimony and my very long 20-page written testimony that I submitted the day before, you know, I talked about how these terms are something that are much more rhetorical or, in the words that they were actually using at the hearing, uh, marketing Tools. And when you do that, it can evoke a false sense of really authority on the subject. So you hear that, you assume you know what it means, and then you'll go to town arguing about it, even though you don't really understand the nuance of mm. what's actually being proposed. And then the flip side of that is that it also makes you think you're doing something that you may or may not be doing when you actually look at the legislation, which can provide not only a, a person thinking they know what's going on, but then also kind of luring them into a false sense of security, thinking that one thing's being done when really, ultimately, these proposed amendments, like the ATF's proposed amendments and the laws that are introduced, are neutered down versions of what they sound like they are. Well, let me... Let me... For people who to try to understand what you just said, people know what happened with the history of the so-called assault weapons ban, and everybody thought they knew what that meant. And then when you get into the, the guts of the bill, you go, wait a minute, that's my deer hunting rifle. Yeah, it is, but they're going to keep calling that a assault weapon. Same thing's happening with these so-called ghost guns. Everybody thinks they know what that is, but in truth, it's one of those kind of like infinitely expandable terms, isn't it? Yeah, and you know, one of the things I joked and then ultimately put in my written report uh, was the fact that when I first heard the term ghost gun, you know, years ago, whenever it started, whoever started it, um, I remember thinking that that meant something like Bruce Willis, you know, take it through security kind of thing, like something that almost evaded um, security before oh. being used in a crime. Yeah. Okay. And so when you hear that term, you know, it can make people think a lot of different things. And it doesn't necessarily always evoke the thought about uh, an, quote, unquote, untraceable firearm and really something that you're trying to use after a crime is committed. And that's why I kind of thought the title of the hearing at Stop Gun Violence to be rather interesting, because really most of the conversation circulating around these, you know, privately made firearms, and specifically the ones that are not serialized, is it's used as a tracing tool if it's if the firearms recovered from a crime. So really we're talking about after crime, not necessarily preventing it. So what, you know, you are in fact an actual no kidding, real, you know, real deal firearms historian. What's the history of home-built firearms in America? Well, it's, it actually predates America because if you think about it from a really kind of basic level, and, and for a long time I kept trying to think that it was something more than this, but it's really not. 
But essentially, until you had major manufacturing processes put in place, you had home-built guns. Individual gun makers were making firearms. When you look at the colonies leading up to the American Revolution, what people don't always re realize is not only were there private gun makers making firearms who were essential to the military effort, but they were ordering parts kits from over in Europe and over in England and using those to assemble firearms, you know, similar in concept to the parts kits that we think of today. So hmm. they were not only essential to the war effort, but they were also making firearms for the civilian population and gun collecting became incredibly popular dating to the 1600s in Europe. And so it's about as old as our country and older if you go overseas. Mm -hmm. And then the other point that I made uh, during my testimony was, even though during the Industrial Revolution, we created more standard processes in order to, you know, mass manufacture different items, including firearms, the role of the individual never went away and the role of the private gun maker, you know, never went away. I avoided using this uh, term in this way uh, in, during my testimony, but I basically said, you know, there was this crazy Mormon from Utah who was building machine guns in his backyard, and the government didn't seem to mind that. Uh, and, of course, John, I'm talking about John, John Brownie. Brownie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, you know, and really, much of the advances in technology and firearms design and building have been from tinkerers and people who are individual gun builders. Exactly. And when you think about it, I mean, it's it's really so, so normal in terms of the history of firearms, especially in this country, that we've always relied on individuals for innovation. And that's really what's going on a lot with the 3D printing right now, which as a historian, I'm not even going to touch on <laughs> mm -hmm. any type of 3D printing technology, but I know lots of people that are doing it. And so when you regulate this ability to individually innovate, you ultimately end up inhibiting any real progress that can be made across the board. Because if the government's looking for something, you know, there's all kinds of bureaucracy that can go into the government actually having to make it. And that's why the government did it for a little bit, but then they ultimately relied on, you know, subcontractors to do that. And so it's one of those things that people don't think about. It sounds scary, but it's so common. It's interesting because there are people, and you know, uh, people in the gun community, people, shooters, gun collectors, whatever, who say, well, yeah, but, you know, I don't know that we really need to have people be able to do that. It, it just irritates me anytime I hear somebody in our gun community want to break off and say, well, yeah, but we ought to have some regulation. We ought to have some stripping away of our rights without any appreciation for the chain of events that we don't, we don't even have to imagine. We've seen it throughout history of take a little, get a little bit more, get a little bit more. And the only way to stop that is to not let them get any. Well, and the other part to that hearing, and I'm not sure if everybody in the room had read the proposed amendment that was released by the ATF. The Friday before, uh, mm -hmm. I quickly read it so that I could incorporate it into my testimony. Although I will say I, I found out Friday I was going to the hearing on Tuesday, so I was oh, kind wow. of rushing to, to get it done. But the other half of that is not just, you know, the understanding the historical evolution of this, but then also looking at the proposed amendments to these privately made firearms, which is actually a term that the ATF is proposing, probably one of the better terms mm -hmm. uh, that they've proposed over the years. But when you look at what they're proposing, it's not actually accomplishing what people are saying it's accomplishing. And when you look at the new definitions that they're trying to kind of put together, they're so ambiguous that it almost can be used to interpret many things. And if I remember correctly, it's also planning to put far more power into the director of the ATF rather than Congress making the call on these different things. And so when you look at the amendment versus what we were actually talking about, they were wanting them to be eliminated off the streets or serialized on transfer. And some of those things popped up in the proposed amendment. But for the most part, it wasn't anything along the lines of the discussion that was being had in the hearing, even though that's what it was supposed to be about. Well, you know, and let me just put the fine point on this. What we're talking about is a proposal where ATF, it, it'd be a huge change. Up until this point, Congress has decided what is and is not a firearm. That was a job of Congress. What this would do would flip it around to where the ATF, unelected bureaucrats, could decide what is or is not a firearm and de can declare something that 
Last year was not a firearm, and this year becomes a firearm, and now it's regulated, and there is no vote taken on it by elected representatives. Is that a fair representation of what we're talking about? Yeah, and and it really does come down to this, what is a firearm and what's not a firearm. And in talking to my husband, uh, Mark Hanish, who is you know in the firearms industry as well, I they, guess that's he is. happened before, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in terms of what is, a, what is a firearm and what's not. I think there was an FN uh, that was judged to be different than the other, you know, <laughs> lower mm-hmm. receivers. And so it's happened before, but the proposed amendments are, you know, they open the door even more to that potential for interpretation, which, as the ATF for a little bit called a shoelace, a machine gun, uh, yes. we, I don't know if I would trust them with all the terminology that we want to use. The other thing that I found faulty with the proposed amendment was the argument in and of itself of why they need to change it. And one of the big arguments was that this technology didn't exist or wasn't prevalent back when the definitions were originally made. And one of the big things, I won't get into all of them, but one of the big things that they brought up was striker fire guns. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely absurd to to claim that they weren't around or weren't prevalent at the time the definitions were made. You know, striker fire guns have been around in early bolt action form since the, you know, mid-1800s, but actual, you know, more modern concept striker fires, early 1900s, late 1800s. But the entire or a huge portion of the Gun Control Act of 1968, which kind of started this whole conversation, was the regulation of Saturday night specials, which were inexpensive striker fire guns from Europe. (laughs) So <laughs> I just thought it was, you know, it, yeah. was, it was fascinating to me that the, the logic of why they need to do this, which certainly need to justify why you're going to make a huge change, but the justification was historically inaccurate and faulty. And well, the government was ordering striker fires for a really long time, too. So it's not like the government had no knowledge of this, which is really fascinating. Well, thank you so much for providing the historical background that they, they needed. I don't know if they heard it. I do want to let people know that you can make comments. The comment period is open for the ATF proposal uh, on so-called ghost guns, um, uh, home manufactured guns. Ashley, where can people keep up with what you're doing these days? Well, if you want to check me out, I'm at History and Heels on Instagram and at Official Ashley Levinsky on Facebook. There you go. Thank you so much, and say hi to Mark for us. Will do. Talk to you later. You you take care, Ashley Levinsky. Yeah, I actually went on a a really cool dove hunt with the two of them uh, in Argentina a few years ago. Great couple, and boy, does she know her stuff. 